So this is the Night of the Lights went out in Vegas, a demystifying of smart mirror networks. I'm Barrett Weissart, I'm a consultant with Trustway Spider Labs, and with me is Garrett Piccioni from the University of Arizona. And let's kind of dive in here. So really what we sought to do, since uh, a lot's been made in the news in the last few years, smart meters, smart grid, and such, and there's even been some security research <laughs> All right, full start. I break things without even trying, so. <laughs> Stand on one leg. Oh. oh, I thought you had the, oh, gotcha. Okay. Thank you much. <laughs> Thank you to our wonderful technical staff. <laughs> Try this again. All right, uh, starting back up. So, really, what we sought to do, since uh, there's been a lot made in the news and uh, really a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt put in about what the smart grid is, how vulnerable it is, and such, as well as uh, a few quality security presentations in the last few years on how susceptible meters are to uh, to vulnerabilities and, and the hacking and things. Uh, we kind of sought to kind of cut through, uh, kind of cut through the bowl to try to find out really what's the underlying technology, what are we dealing with here, and to kind of go at it from a network traffic-based approach. So, how do these devices communicate? Uh, you know, what concepts are at play? What protocols are in use? Just how do these things tick? And uh, just a caveat: we aren't, you know, RF gods. SCADA experts, industry insiders, hardware gods, we're really just pen testers and network geeks. So just enthusiasts, people who are just curious about this and kind of coming at it from a security fundamentals perspective. So what this presentation is not. So we're not here to own the smart grid, smart meters, anything like that. Uh, this isn't how to get free power. Uh, obviously, regardless of what you may or may not do, you know, sometimes look before you leap, uh, exercise a little bit of caution, just Unless you be the one carted off stage, <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a gray area in terms of some of the some of the uh, concepts involved. But better safe than sorry. And uh, finally, this is not how to black out Las Vegas. Uh, if the power does go out, I've got a flashlight and some hand puppets, but not as much exciting as a uh, as a PowerPoint. And finally, this you know it's not Ocean's Eleven, Twelve, or Thirteen. I'm not George Clooney. Garrett's a poor man's Matt Damon at best. So. <laughs> <laughs> So let's get into it a little bit. So what's really what is smart metering? And in order to understand this, we'll go back to a bit of a history lesson. And as you can see from the man staring intently at the meter with some sort of techno lust in his eyes, uh, <laughs> basically meters since the dawn of basically the age of electricity. And to kind of back up a second too, when we say, when we make reference to the smart grid and the smart meters and things like that, we're primarily referring to electrical utilities, but you can transpose a lot of these concepts to gas and water as well. Those are coming into play a little bit. So first generation meters. You've got a guy, comes out in a van, parks his van, and takes a look at your meter. Takes a reading, goes back, does it once a month. You know, works, works decently well, uh, pretty manual of sorts. But obviously it's a slow, cumbersome process. Not really any way to forecast demand in any great detail. And it's a high overhead. You've got a lot of people coming out, meeting, uh, reading meters, going back, and you know you rely on his readings and, and whatnot. So this idea had to be kind of a bit of a better way. So second generation meters, kind of a, kind of a one-way technology. So replace that guy out looking at your uh, looking at your meter with a guy, you know, little uh, little portable unit or a van drives around, takes a reading from the curb. Um, you know, drives around in the neighborhood and such. So obviously, this is a bit of a bit of an improvement. You know, you've got uh, you've got uh, you know a little bit of efficiency uh, of scale and such. But again, you're still you're doing monthly readings, so you, you know you're not really getting a quality demand forecast or anything interesting like that. So again, there there's a bit of room for improvement here. So introduction to. I guess the third generation meters, uh, the automated metering infrastructure, so AMI. Now, the idea of this is you create, in effect, a large closed off, basically, system, a metropolitan uh, wireless network of itself, wherein the meters can communicate in a two-way fashion. So, 
generally, the idea is that you have your meters, small transceiver sorts, communicate with either relay towers or directly to the central utility uh, via some mechanism. We'll get to that in a second. And the idea is that you can basically pass a variety of information back and forth and uh, do a lot of things that would not require you to actually send out a manual human or do anything of that nature. So first question, why? Why would we want to do something like this? Well, the utilities have quite a bit of a reason why, and we're stating this without any sort of bias as to whether you know, the viability or efficacy of these options for the utility or the consumer. But first of all, to be able to reduce staff overhead on the part of the utility. You take away all those guys in vans, you know, for better or for worse, obviously. In economic times, you, you cut a lot of jobs, but the idea is, hey, I, have, I don't have to send all those people out in vans with any sort of equipment, and uh, hey, I can just get an idea, get a read from the central office. Second, if I want to start a stop -a meter, usually you've got to schedule a date for that. Guy comes out, does his business, and leaves. Well, in this one, I can just start and stop service basically instantaneously if I really want. Uh, third, and perhaps most importantly, you can actually get a pretty good forecast for demand. You can monitor, basically you can monitor meters hourly, daily, whatnot, and get an idea for what the peak demand is. And with the idea of creating a more, sort of a more reliable grid, the idea that you can hopefully have fewer blackouts, brownouts, and such. And of course, something that you, the utilities probably really like, demand pricing. So during peak areas, and uh, you know, people who, probably still have cell phones with peak minutes and things like that will know this is, you know, you make a, a demand for electricity during a, during a peak time, well, you get charged more. And in theory, they want this to kind of shape customer demand, but also it does bring in more, uh, more profit. So on the consumer side, well, what are we getting out of this? Now, the idea is the consumer can actually monitor and track their own consumption. Usually the utility will have some sort of portal that they can kind of look and say, well, you use X number of kilowatt hours, X number of gallons of water, you know, whatnot. Uh, and the idea, well, in theory, you can say, well, gosh, I really uh, was running my air conditioner all this time last month. Okay, I'm going to try to adjust, and we'll see how it reacts on a day-to-day -day or hour-to-hour -hour basis. Second, the utilities have this idea of a grand future with smart appliances. So. I can actually have a, an opt-in where my air conditioner will say, okay, I'm part of the utilities demand program. So it's the peak of summer. There's a tremendous demand for you know, air conditioners, fridges, all sorts of cooling equipment. I can actually say, well, I'd like to opt in to where the utility can you know, lower my air conditioner a, a couple degrees, uh, turn it off entirely, or basically have some sort of control over my energy consumption. And the idea of it being either the same or reduced costs. Because if it's the same cost for the consumer, in theory, you still have an enhanced infrastructure. And if it's reduced cost, well, even better for the consumer. So next, uh, Garrett's going to get into what makes up a typical smart meter. OK, so the, uh, the smart meters hardware is with some subtle changes. It's more or less the same, give or take, uh, across vendors. You still have the basic idea um, of, of a, a core set of components. Um, like Barrett said earlier, um, our talk is mainly geared towards um, electric meters, but the same concepts can be applied also in um, the uh, gas and water industry as well because they're also um, attempting to implement this kind of technology as well for the same ideas. Um, typical hardware that you're going to find in a, me in a meter, it's, it's, it's pretty basic. Um, you've got a 32-bit ARM processor or something similar, 256K of RAM, so really, really tiny footprint here, and only 512K of flash memory here. And that's, um, you know, in terms of storage and, and running the firmware and stuff, that's really all you need. Um, a transceiver, those, can, those are a little bit different, depending on the vendor, we'll get to that in a bit, and some sort of communication method. And, and in most cases, it's just regular TCP IP. The idea behind these is, is that you want to have as small of a footprint as possible um, and have, you know, a core set of you know, a couple of features that just work really well and are just absolutely solid on this platform. And you want to have it, uh, you know, cost effective so that way the electric companies can roll these out to, you know, a, a, you know, a few million uh, person city without having a uh, overwhelming impact on, on their costs. Um, 
Uh, you also want to have the idea of uh, these meters, we still need them to report because they're running off of you know, the power grid in some sense. Well, what happens when there's a blackout? So they do need to have some sort of uh, um, auxiliary power, if you will, so that way they, um, they are able to uh, report during blackout saying, hey, you know, this house is without power and, and, and things of that nature. So instead of the way that it's currently set where you, know, you rely on the power or the utility companies rely on customers calling to complain when there's an outage, you know, in this case, the, the meter will just report it for you instead, which is kind of a kind of a win-win situation there. Um, uh, and that's yeah, uh, pretty much the basics of it. There, it's all pretty pretty simple. So, so next, we're going to kind of look into a uh, different types of smart meters and uh, and how they communicate. So, you know, what are the tubes uh, or the the virtual wireless tubes? So, first and probably the most popular. Uh, type of solution out there that you might see, uh, perhaps in your local municipality or, or whatnot, is licensed spectrum. Uh, a lot of these uh, meter makers have basically begun purchasing, buying up uh, just very narrow uh, bits of licensed spectrum in the 900 megahertz range. And what they do within that range to sort of produce transmission reliability, even though technically they should be the only the only thing transmitting in that region. They also utilize things like frequency hopping spread spectrum, uh, frequency shift keying, and, and a variety of things to just kind of make sure that there's minimal interference. And this really introduces quite a bit of reliability in transmission. So that way, you know, your, your meters are communicating, there are fewer outages, and that way you try to keep things online and talking, uh, talking to home as much as possible. Uh, the idea that it's actually a hybrid star mesh network. So you've actually got a meter if you can see here in the diagram with the wonderful red houses and such, <laughs> that basically normally you would have a home and a meter communicating directly with one or more relay towers back to the central, uh, basically the central uh, utility. But the idea is that you actually can also have another meter pass off a message through an adjacent meter. Uh, it's known as buddy mode in certain implementations that it can basically pass off messages if it's out of radio range. So if you've got, for, for whatever reason, the meter on your house isn't quite talking to the, talking to the base station. It can basically pass it off through your neighbor's meter, for better or for worse. And essentially, it provides quite a few quite a few advantages. Uh, again, like I said, reliability. Uh, you've got you know pretty reliable transmission given those technologies. Longevity. You've actually I mean you've bought the whole system end to end. You own the meters, the relay towers, the central you know the central receiver and, and such. And so, you know, the, the idea you can basically use it perpetually as long as you, the license for that band is renewed. So, kind of some of the other interesting things about this, you may, they actually do introduce some preliminary security features. Uh, they usually, meters are actually sent out of the factory with a, uh, a unique AES encryption key. And the idea that you can actually have keys for, unique for each meter as well as keys for each group in the utility. So, I could actually, that message that I send from my meter through my neighbor, my neighbor can't actually read what the message is because that key is shared between myself and the central utility. And the idea is that the, all these keys are shared between the meters and the utilities such that if a meter perhaps is taken offline or something happens, I should be able to revoke that key from the central location and that meter is effectively knocked off in theory again. So. Again, uh, a couple of a couple of other things. They typically include some, you know, pretty reasonable basic physical security tamper controls, things like that. Uh, let's see some of the other things. Uh, and you know, it's kind of the long and short of uh, sort of the basis of it. And some of the caveats, unfortunately, is that you know the the overhead you have to buy the system end to end, and also it's proprietary for now. It, it, they are moving towards the standard. We'll get to that in a second, but. Right now, really a lot of these different implementations do things in different ways. So if you buy meters from vendor A, you're probably locked in end to end for equipment from vendor A. Okay, so the, um, the next type of meter that you're gonna commonly see is one that, um, that communicates based off of, the cell, uh, off of a cell network as opposed to um, you know, your own licensed spec infrastructure. Um, they're, pri they're primarily GSM based, so here in the States that, that pretty much limits you to AT&T and T-Mobile. Um, some vendors offer a CDMA option, but it's really, it's not widely used. They don't really advertise it a whole lot. It's just a, 
you know, if you absolutely have to have it, it's there. Um, and it's point-to-point it's -point connectivity. So, um, you know, you're, you're t the meter is talking directly over, um, directly from, you know, itself up to the, uh, up to the ut uh, utility station. The advantages of that is, you know, you're already using um, existing infrastructure. You do not have to roll out your own license spec setup or anything like that. You, you know, you, re you rely on the cell tower. You rely on AT&T or T-Mobile to do it for you. And, you know, you worry about them. You take that for what you will, I guess. Um, uh, you know, you let them spend the money to, to roll, out, uh, roll out service and coverage into other, you know, into other areas. You don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, your coverage cell, cell networks in, in, one, in one form or another are, are just about everywhere. It's, it's, it's pretty difficult nowadays to find a, a place within reason, I guess, uh, that, you know, at least, that you at least can't get some sort of signal to transmit something. Um, and you have, the, you have the layered security of GSM. Um, I don't know how, how <laughs> secure that is now, thanks to Chris's talk a couple hours ago. But, um, but uh, it, it, it's at least there. Um, so you know, it, it's, not it's not like you're cra you know, cracking web networks or anything like that. There is at least uh, some sort of layer of security. And you know, the, the possibility of having a VPN tunnel between the meter and the, and the utility station for that kind of direct point-to-point -point connectivity. Um, your disadvantages, your, your you're really at the you know the mercy of whoever you're contracting for, for for the cell carriers. I mean, if you know a telco decides to change a change a new standard or change to a new you know set of in, uh, form of infrastructure, and you know the meters are just incompatible with it for one reason or another, it's you know tough luck, I guess. You know, figure figure out a solution. I, I you know I would assume that they would attempt to work with you, but you know the you know the the power companies or something are you know not going to probably stop. Uh, cell networks from expanding or, or rolling out new technologies and, and, and things like that. And you know, is it kind of is it future proof? Well, our cell, you know, our, I'm sure cell networks for now seem pretty solid, but it, how, how long really? You know, uh, we've been using basic utility meters for you know since power, you know, since power first started, and um, you know, cell, cell infrastructures are, are really have only come into play within the last you know, 20, 30 years or so, and. Just a couple of things to think of, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just as for his third example, there's kind of a couple other minor implementations, and I, I say minor just because you don't see them as often in the states. You may actually see uh, power line. The idea is that your your metering infrastructure is basically done over the same lines that transmit your uh, your power, and just because of the attenuation and the distance runs, you really see this in more small regions uh, within countries in the EU, uh, really in Japan, things like that. It, it's it's really, uh, again, not really uh, that common in North America, so it's a, it's a bit of a minor player. Broadband, it's just sort of interesting. They actually, there's been some specs out there for just sort of an open communication network, and it's very uh, medium agnostic, and they use just a, a variety of existing transmission technologies. So, so in effect, you, you basically are putting... Uh, Open to using, uh, you know, broadband, whether it's metropolitan Wi-Fi or uh, basically 4G or, or whatnot. So the idea that you could basically create a sort of a set of standards and again, pretty much TCP/IP based that you could talk to, uh, it, utilizing it, it's going to be very similar. In other words, to things like, you know, GPRS and the idea that you can be flexible, I guess, with the uh, in leverage existing technologies. So. Next, uh, you see how basically how you communicate with the meter. Well, so what can you do inside your home once it goes inside the meter? So basically, the idea of home area networks and smart appliances. So it's going to Han home area network, and you know I'm sure a lot of you in the past have played with X10 and things like that. But so this the idea about this is that you create something that's going to be a universal device interface that can communicate, you have a home controller and it can communicate with you know, your air conditioner, your fridge, down to your remote control and maybe even your security system, so a variety of things. But obviously the challenges for that, if you want to have sensors on every last window, your doorbell, you know, your remote, you have to have something that's a pretty small footprint, pretty low power, and that's kind of where Wi-Fi and Bluetooth kind of get knocked off just because you, you know, you're not going to have a remote control that is using 802.11 just because of the high power costs and you're not using Bluetooth just because it is a fairly high power as well as it has a pretty long wake up time so it's not really that good for instantaneous communication. 
um, has to be secure on some level. I mean, you really don't want your neighbors playing with your stereo or, you know, uh, disabling your security system when you're out of town. So, you know, you have to have some sort of security mechanism, and that's pretty much where X10 kind of drops off the map, as well as the fact that X10 has a very, just very paltry transmission uh, bandwidth for things like that. So, but still, despite that, we still need something that's low bandwidth. I mean, not, you know, pretty efficient. All you really need to do is send some sort of command, some sort of basic data set. So the thing that's been kind of the leader, or at least the winner in this so far, has been Zigbee. So it's actually, part of it is the uh, IEEE 802.15.4, which basically specifies the physical and actually the data link layer. Zigbee kind of goes all the way up to the application profile, uh, basically uh, all the way up. And it's, it's not TCP IP, but it uses a very similar OSI model. So for practical and sensitive purposes, you can kind of, kind of intuit one over to the other. Uh, again, it's a bit of a mesh star cluster topology. You can have devices relay from one to the other back to your sort of master controller or your coordinator, I guess is, is the proper term. It's uh, pretty low bandwidth, about you know, 250 kilobits a second, you know, so not too, uh, not too much. It's uh, actually, it's sort of, it's sort of a, if you want to think about it, it's almost kind of like a, a, a bit of a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, of sorts. It's also another good kind of metaphor. And it was originally developed for industrial implementation, but the idea is it kind of carried over into home, home use just because they thought they could find kind of advantages for it. Um, it's really only, it's got a pretty short transmission range, about 100 feet. So you want things that will stay inside the home, nothing that carries down the block, and uh, on average, of course. Uh, so really, what, sh what uh, some of the interaction that you'd want to be doing, let's say, uh, you know, let's say you take your car in for service, you know, you get on board diagnostics. Well, let's say your fridge compressor goes out, or your fridge compressor is failing. Your fridge notifies you and says, hey, you know, I noticed my compressor is failing, you better dispatch someone. Saves you a little bit of headache and time and worry. Uh, you actually have, let's say a window says, okay, my window break just broke, okay, trip the alarm, things like that. So you, you basically actually have different types of devices with different types of profiles. Uh, depending on what, uh, what use. And again, this is actually secured by, uh, by AES, and it's actually kind of, I guess, the, the trend in which, uh, which AES is moving towards, for those of you who know a little bit about, about WPA2 with uh, AES CCMP, you basically are turning a block cipher into a stream cipher. So they actually use something called EAX, which is sort of a less complicated version of, of, of CCM. The idea that you're basically chaining, uh, chaining block to block without getting too much down the uh, down the crypto path there. So and let's after that let's know a little bit of uh, kind of the security and policy implications of all this, which is kind of the kind of the crux of everything, right? So basically, what we want to know is is this secure? And uh, this is actually a damning question that used to be asked by a professor of mine that. He'd turn after showing a solution and basically say, okay, so is this secure? And you'd be absolutely paralyzed to actually answer this question because you're afraid if you said yes, you'd have to explain why. And if you said no, you'd also have to explain why. In either way, if you were wrong, he'd absolutely just carve you up with the absolute correct answer. So to really answer this question, it, it does depend. And, and again, you know, the best security in the world can be kind of cut apart by a poor implementation. So you have to ask yourself a few questions. So first of all, who are our attackers? Now, you may have someone who's just an enthusiast, a kind of a thrill seeker, someone who's curious. I can't imagine there are too many of those people here. <laughs> uh, you have people, just vandals, people who kind of want to say, well, hey, if I can black out my neighbor, let's just mess with my neighbor. Let's, you know, turn his laundry on or, you know, make his fridge burn out or, you know, just, just, just mess with people, vandals of sorts. And then, of course, probably the most interesting and probably the most dangerous uh, type of this are basically, you know, let's say, uh, you know, terrorism, espionage, people who actually are pretty well funded, pretty well intent on saying, if I can get control of this infrastructure, I can do some serious damage. I mean, I can, let's say I can turn off the alarm system for a bank, I can black out an entire grid and cause havoc. You know, it's a whole variety of things. So... The second, it really only makes sense to use if you use all the features. So a lot of manufacturers say, well, gosh, we've got this, we've got AS, we've got, we introduce entropy, we do this. And then they say, oh, by the way, all these features are optional. <laughs> and, well, yeah, if you strip out all the features, for example, of the 900 megahertz system, 
you're basically less left with frequency hopping spread spectrum, which in itself, if you don't know the hop schedule, isn't, it's okay as far as it is somewhat of a measure, except, well, let's say I go disassemble a meter, buy a meter on eBay, I get the hop schedule, and bam, it's just like you were you know, passing it across you know, in the clear. So uh, third, obviously, again, as Garrett mentioned, reliance on third-party security. Uh, you're putting yourself at the mercy of someone else's solution. And you know, a lot of utilities say, well, we don't really know a whole lot about that. We'll just we'll rely on AT&T to really kind of figure out uh, what's going on. Uh, a lot of GPRS meter manufacturers will say, well, our network is private IP because, hey, that way no one can route to it. Well, so is every cell phone. <laughs> So, again, you know, some of these things that are touted as features are what we call feature fluff. It's just these are things which are touted as features but not really explained well or just sort of a bunch of just crap thrown onto a piece of paper without actual context. And some of the other things, uh, security through obscurity, it definitely, uh, for example, they like to say, well, we use a proprietary frequency, frequency shift keying schedule. You won't actually, you know, hey, they don't know it, it's not published, you won't be able to find it. Well, again, I grab myself a meter, I'll find it. Uh, some of the proprietary command sets, well, how do people know how to send commands to meters? Our data set isn't published. Well, again, people with enough time will find a way. And probably most important of all is physical security. Uh, as anyone knows, really you can implement the best system known to mankind, but if I can physically access your devices, you're pretty much out of luck. So the idea, let's say I want to find out the frequency shift key, uh, the frequency hopping schedule. Uh, so let's say, okay, I don't want to take apart my meter because then they might think it's me. Well, I don't really like my neighbor. I'm just going to steal his meter. You know, they all talk in the same hop schedule. Well, bam, there I am. Uh, so again, physical security, you really, you have to keep that into account. Uh, for example, in my, in my particular complex, the meters are behind a locked door. So not too bad, it's at least an additional measure. So it's something to, to take into account. Um, again, the location, actually the spread nature of the network actually helps. It's sort of a, uh, both a blessing and a curse. The idea that if I want to attack the network, I can basically go anywhere the network is. So you know, with buddy mode, I can pass commands off where, anywhere there's a, basically anywhere there's a meter. So it makes attacks on the network pretty hard to trace or diagnose. And again, kind of as a follow-up to physical security, you really have to be, be able to respond to incidents as they happen. So meter X is compromised, well, immediately revoke its key so it can't communicate for the network. And uh, you know, if you're anything like me, when you first read about a lot of the AES stuff, you said, well, why don't they just use PKI, something of that nature? Well, you gotta take into account, you're dealing with a system where every meter is inherently set up to be trusted, basically an explicit trust. So the idea is that if that key is compromised in any sort of way, you should be able to revoke it at the core and have the security of the system be retained. Okay, so these are kind of the current, these are, these are some uh, you know, mar marketing, um, I would call them marketing, so they're not very technical, even though that was what the, some, of the, some vendors were trying to, to portray them as, um, that I thought were a little entertaining. Uh, they, you know, they told me not to, so I won't. Um, this, was a, this was a quote off of a, uh, a, uh, a promotional material for, for a meter. Our network is secure, because, you know, our, they, they're telling you because we're, we're purchasing licensed spec on the, on the 900 megahertz um, you know, spectrum, that, that inherently means just because we own that for the time being, that nobody could ever, ever want to go do that, just because the FCC says that you're not allowed to. And, well, obviously, probably not so much, especially with, you know, folks here and everyone else that are just kind of, you know, wanting to play around with things. Um, transmissions cannot be duplicated using off-the-shelf equipment with a, you know, if we have this outstanding device called the USRP, which is a, uh, you know, is, is a software radio if you aren't familiar with it. And, you know, with that, and I can get a transceiver that broadcasts on 900, uh, you know, transmits and receives on, on 900 megahertz as well. With some, you know, with, with, with a little bit of uh, development or developer knowledge, I can customize the USRP in such a way that, you know, I should have, I should have no difficulties at least, you know, trying to pick up traffic. And then once you pick it up from there, it's, it's you know, it's only a matter of time, depending on the security that's in place, on whether or not you can read it or do something with it in, in, in some capacity. 
um, critical infrastructure. So there's that, that's a for for those that are unfamiliar, that's a designation by the uh, Department of Homeland Security. They consider um, certain things to be quote unquote critical infrastructures, like you know the electric grid, water grid, sewer, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they don't inherently they don't explicitly say this, but does. It, say you know a, a, a local telco decides to use a meter that's based off of GSM, because of that by proxy, does that mean that you know AT and T or, or or what have you is now that network in that city from AT and T is that considered to be critical infrastructure and falls under the same you know extra protections that the uh, the, the home Department of Homeland Security may offer to other um, other uh, you know critical pieces of infrastructure. Um, here's a couple more um, implement, uh, you know, implications. If, if we're going to do this, you know, if, if this is actually going to happen and they're going to make a, you know, the utility companies are going to make a massive infrastructure change and roll these meters out, there needs to be a couple of sanity checks first. Like in, in the first case, you know, we need to make sure that the meters actually work properly. Um, California, uh, PG&E tried to roll smart meters out and um, had a heck of a time with it when they realized that um, the meters were not billing correctly. Um, folks were getting bills or for for uh, service utilization that were you know two and three times what they were normally using, and you know it's just these basic fundamental things that you need to make sure actually work before you go out and roll these out to a city. Um, you know, there's also privacy issues as as well. Um, you know, appliance control, um, electrical surveillance. Um, you know, the appliance control. If you opt into the, um, you know, the service that the utility companies offer, um, where you know they may adjust your appliances for you depending on, you know, um, the amount of utilization on the grid. Uh, you know, things like that. Um, there's also there's a lot of security that goes into preventing somebody from actually tampering with the meter. You know, there's there's um, there's accelerometers in them and tilt sensors and things like that to, to, to detect if somebody's trying to remove the meter. Um, and a, a bunch of security that prevents the average consumer from trying to tamper with them in any way. But there's really not a whole lot of set policies in place on preventing maybe the electric company from doing things that maybe you perhaps don't want them to with your appliances and their um, you know, in their policies like that. There's really no, it's kind of, it's, the security is one way, but it's definitely not the other way. There's no real policy in, um, in place on what could the, the electric company do with my washing machine? Could they just shut my AC off because, you know, when it's 100 degrees outside, just because they're having peak demand at that time? You know, uh, things like that. You can also, I mean, you can monitor appliances and, and based off of utilization trends and things like that, you can, uh, the, the utility companies can, can get a good idea of when um, you know when you're turning your washing machine on, or, or when you're you know using your electric oven and, and things like that. And I guess if you're if you're if you're one that's trying to live in a world of complete you know secrecy and anonymity, you might have a you may have a problem with that. But it's I don't know it's pro it's probably something that not a whole lot of people will think about. I mean, you know your your TV companies monitor your TV channel trends, and the, you know and the police departments. You know, watch things like the sewers and and to see if you know perhaps drugs are being flushed down to try and sniff out drug houses and you know things like that. There's all these little things that are done transparently by the government or by companies in the background that I guess depending on who you are is whether or not you may actually care. So, with that in mind, who really ultimately benefits from these new implementations? And you know, first answer may be utilities. Well. No, seriously, utilities. The uh, really upfront, they have cost savings. Uh, we discussed that previously. They've got enhanced ability to monitor, control demand, uh, fluctuate pricing, all sorts of benefits. Plus, on top of that, due to the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act, the government is actually giving them money for certain implementations, uh, just as, as a provision of that. They do have some provisions in that act to require security to be in place, but it's not entirely clear what those provisions might actually be. And in some cases where the utilities have botched an implementation of smart meters, they are under no illusions that they can't just pass the costs on to consumers. So uh, now on the other side, the poor consumer. Well, if you think about it, really you, your utilities are a lot like gas. Let's say you commute. You really can't avoid not buying gas. It's, it's a pretty inelastic demand. 
much the same as if your favorite TV show comes on seven at seven, you you know you can opt not to watch it. But ultimately, you're going to be employing some sort of device that uses that consumes power, whether you record it, watch your TV. I'm not going to do my dishes at three in the morning. I'm <laughs> I'm not going to uh, you know I'm not going to start vacuuming the floors at all hours of the night. Realistically, the consumer's not really going to change their habits just because they have fluctuating demand and, and prices like that. So really, ultimately, the consumer's probably going to get more benefit from actually having power-saving and power-conscious devices. So let's see, a Zigbee wear fridge. Uh, if anyone ever saw LG's $10,000 smart tablet fridge that really was yeah, not very well selling a few years ago, a uh, picture of a version of that that actually works. And let's say when you know, your fridge has fewer groceries in it, it backs off on the cooling. Or let's say you can have something that just is ultimately a little more power thrifty. Ultimately, probably the biggest beneficiaries on the consumer side of this are going to be manufacturing. So you can actually manufacture, so let's say I, I can totally schedule my shift for 2 a.m. where there are lower rates for, uh, for process runs. So absolutely, I, I can see some consumer benefit in that particular area. So really, where is this going? And unfortunately, you know, like it or not, this is this is coming. This this is where the smart grid is going. Uh, more and more implementations are being rolled out. And the good news is, it, it's a replacement of some aging infrastructure. And I, I won't really comment as again, I'm not a SCADA expert. But uh, as people have seen with uh, things like a lot of the uh, like the link, uh, a lot of the link auto run things, that there are attacks out there that target SCADA systems specifically. So if this is part of a rollout of a more enhanced and hopefully more well thought out infrastructure in terms of security, it's probably going to ultimately be a positive thing. However, we do need a standard. Uh, a lot of these systems do use TCP IP as their backbone, but as far as what messages they send, how they send them, and uh, the rate at which they send them, et cetera, are still very proprietary and vendor specific. However, there are two standards out there that are being championed by a few vendors, ANSI 12.19, which is the idea for uh, the data that's sent by a metering system and 12.22, which is actually the protocol for how it's, uh, that said data is actually transmitted over the wire and usually over TCP IP. You'll, I believe there might actually be an IETF draft for that out there somewhere. Uh, so finally, and, and really everyone kind of plays a role in how these systems are coming to you. So utilities, they really have a responsibility to deploy securely and responsibly, whether they will or not probably remains to be seen. Uh, the government really needs to, since if they say it's critical infrastructure and they're, they're really you know, clamping down on this, they really need to continue to regulate this somewhat. You know, modestly, not overtly, but they really need to keep an eye out to make sure that utilities don't practice price gouging or any sort of uh, really counterproductive things. I mean, again, it, it's, it's going to be some form of capitalism, but since the system is not like, you know, this isn't uh, you know, a paintball arena, this is something which I need electricity, I need clean water, I need gas or whatnot. This is something you need to look at. And as the consumer, you really need to advocate whether, uh, whether with your vote or just by raising awareness, just by learning more, by attending talks such as these, to basically find out how these systems are being deployed and really what's going on in your specific municipality. So it's kind of some of our to-dos. As far as actual testing, it was, it was kind of a paltry thing, just because with a lot of a lot of these utilities are very very shy at, uh, at getting approval. Obviously, you know we could go ahead and at least gain a little more insight just by you know FCC be damned, uh, try a few things. But really, ultimately, you really want to construct a re legitimate repeatable test environment. We, we'd really like that to be able to say, okay, let's basically have something that's a little more empirical and a little less chaotic to actually determine how things tick and to sort of benefit uh, and to kind of break down things. And ultimately a true examination of the smart meter network from a pen test standpoint. I mean, there's, it's, it's TCP IP. Once you're able to legitimately get on the network, a lot of those concepts that you're used to are going to be in play again. So really from that, uh, questions?
I think, I mean, from, from, from an overall, uh, from a human behavioral standpoint, I can absolutely see changes in demand. But as far as just because someone says, well, your kilowatt hour price is two cents higher, I don't necessarily know if, if that specific is going to get you to change your behavior. I think when it comes to say, okay, guys, we just used $400 worth of heating this last month. The bottom line, yeah, the, the dollar signs will probably get people to change their costs as opposed to the ability to see your demand in more micro time slices. I think in terms of um, you know the inelasticity in, uh, in comparison to whether or not people are willing to make lifestyle changes for, um, for for perhaps lower rates and things like that, I think that where you will see these lifestyle changes are are with things that that don't require any interaction, like charging your electric car or maybe starting the washer when you go to bed or something like or something to that effect. But something as opposed to I guess you know vacuuming your house or um, you know, doing your dishes or, or, or something to that effect, that's probably not something that you're going to be willing to do at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning just to save a couple of pennies on a kilowatt hour. And, and I think that'll also be uh, very kind of capitalistically driven uh, j just by the idea that, you know, like, like you said, auto manufacturers, if you give me a wonderful electric car, that will motivate me to change my behavior uh, more so than the utilities saying, you know, hey, look, I, you know, ba basically... Uh, Smart metering less so, and products and services more so. I think. In the back. Yeah. Not, not as much. I mean, I, I know that was definitely something we came across when kind of doing the during the preparation. But I, I think for the most part, uh, that that would lead more towards uh, definitely from a hardware perspective. And admittedly, we are definitely a little hardware light from uh, from specifics. I, I know uh, the presentation, the IO Active presentation last year, was actually pretty uh, pretty rock solid in terms of uh, kind of basically a little under the hood as far as some of those uh, particular types of devices. And I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it definitely interesting, but definitely something that was a little, uh, little out of our uh, purview for this talk. I'd, oh, yeah. definitely, yeah. yeah. Phase two, we're, phase we're definitely two. looking forward to uh, kind of amping up a little bit. I'd, uh, I, I'd um, bad pun intended. I, I'd be a little worried about maybe directly pr plugging into perhaps your meter if they're if they're charging you for it. I know just because of existing uh, laws and regulations and things like that, the power company or utility companies in general get really nasty if you start messing with their stuff in ways that they do not want you to. And are
Yeah, I, I mean that actually that that would be a legitimate security gap. It, it, a lot of things just because uh, you know, once again, there's there's a lot of ways that utilities want to prevent you from tinkering with their equipment, but they've absolutely left out how in a lot of these participation programs what they can do with your equipment. I mean the uh, sort of any sort of access controls pertaining to your home devices, yeah. they apparently there's not a whole lot in the way of uh, conscious thought on behalf of utilities on this yet. I mean, I mean, it, it's it's unfortunately some of those uh, some of those implementations are, I think they uh, try to basically try to keep the system as stable as possible. But I think at the end of the day, it's 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 a, it's basically more towards, I guess the uh, by micro measurements you, you increase the stable uh, stability of the system as a whole by being able to predict that demand and hopefully decrease the amount of interruptions, but. I, again, that's hopefully it's going to be an inexact science, but hopefully as time goes on, it'll be something that they will get a little bit better at. I mean, if you think, for example, uh, the airline industry has up to the minute uh, forecast for demand for seating and things like that. And after all this time, they've gotten pretty good about knowing exactly how much you'll pay for you know, a flight to Phoenix. So hopefully something similar will happen in the utility industry. But again, it's kind of a wait and see. A lot of the actual specifics, I think, are going to be left up to the manufacturers as to what the feature set is. Your home, ideally, is going to be ultimately controlled by a, uh, a Zigbee coordination module. So the idea is uh, the minute that stops communicating uh, or as some sort of, uh, I guess, abnormal uh, condition, you would hope that, in theory, that, that, would be, uh, that, that device would communicate that to the home coordinator and basically that would relay it to you by some sort of alert mechanism. Uh, as, as far as actual, as far as actual, you know, concrete, what they're going to be able to do? Can I control the temperature? Can I overheat my fridge? Let's say my, you know, if you th if you think about it, let's say you know, Wi-Fi of ten years ago, you know, just abysmal, uh, basically, you know, usually web or nothing. So, let's say let's say a manufacturer starts shipping Zigbee enabled or Zigbee aware devices with you know default settings or something like that. Well, can I join your fridge to my network and then immediately say, I'd like that fridge to turn off the cooling or things like that. So hopefully it'll be a combination of reasonable default security plus a fairly fine grained feature set so you can't do something to, you know, to physically ruin the, uh, the device. If you think about like, for example, uh, if you remember monitors 20 years ago, I, uh, I think there was actually a virus out there that would basically destroy your CRT uh, just by saying the sync mode, uh, out and eventually they finally learned enough to say, okay, we can actually implement this in hardware such that I cannot set, you know, conditions such that I can physically damage the hardware. So hopefully that'll be something similar, but you, appliance manufacturers are usually pretty slow to implement this stuff because it's an extra cost. If there's no buy-in, they feel like there's been a colossal waste of money. And plus everyone likes to bicker over a standard. Looks like we're getting the uh, we're, we're getting the, the cutoff here. The boot. We're going to be in which? Capri one one two. We'll be in one one two. So if anybody else has any other questions, um, feel free to stop by and kind of pick our brains. I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you.